Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Today is Friday, July the 6th, 2018. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. You know, let's talk about two fighters here, James DeGale and Anthony Joshua. One of them understands life a lot better than the other one. Now let me point out, titles matter until they don't, right? When you're a young fighter coming up, I'm sure you want every title imaginable. But when you're established, right? When you have reached the point where you have name recognition and a direct connection with the fans. In other words, the fans come out to see you fight. Then in my opinion, sometimes these titles can actually become hindrances, right? Sometimes these sanctioning bodies start to tell you who to fight and you know that's not the best possible opponent. Understand, the boxing world is so political that you have some guys who are champions who aren't even eligible to be mandatory contenders for another sanctioning body's titles. So if you're the fighter with a direct connection to the fans, you have to make a decision. Are you going to fight the best possible opponent? Are you going to fight who the fans want you to fight for the most glory, for the biggest legacy? Or are you going to kowtow to some sanctioning body and use your title as an excuse not to fight the best available? Now, James DeGale is 32 years old. He knows he doesn't have all the time in the world, right? The time for him to fight big fights is now. He has unfinished business with some big names. George Groves, for example. Badu Jack, for example. Right? James DeGale wants his legacy to read in a way where he addresses the concerns where the Badu Jack crowd out there, the one that says, hey, our guy knocked out James DeGale's teeth. Who was that on the canvas in the last round? It was James DeGale. How was that fight ruled a draw? Right? That's the Badu Jack crowd. I thought DeGale was winning the fight until the knockdown. But you want DeGale and Jack to both address the concerns. Give us some finality. Show us some great boxing. Right? How about the George Groves crowd? They're saying, what does it take? We beat the man as an amateur. We popped his cherry and ended his unbeaten streak as a professional. Why is there any unfinished business with us? Right? What more do you need? Well, James DeGale, of course, has unfinished business from his end. Right? He's saying to himself, hey man, that first fight was close. Quite frankly, DeGale thinks he won that first fight. Right? Some of the newspapers at the fight thought DeGale won that first fight. Right? So DeGale, in the time he has left as a pro, wants to fight the big names, guys he has unfinished business with, and of course there are other guys out there. How long has Adonis Stevenson been champion? Right? Let's say DeGale wants to fight Gilberto Ramirez, unbeaten, right? a rival champion at 168. Well, what if DeGale's sanctioning body says, hey, you can't fight him next. Who should DeGale answer to? Us, the fans, who want to see him against an unbeaten champion? Or some sanctioning body telling him, hey, if you're going to hold our title another six months, you need to fight the people we designate. Understand that Gale has picked the former. He has abdicated his IBF title. 
Jose Uzcate, good fighter, right? Good fighter, but not a fighter who has the history with the Gale that, let's say, Badu Jack has, or that George Groves has, and not a fighter who has the name that, let's say, a Gilberto Ramirez has, or an Adonis Stevenson, right? Or fill in the blank, the winner of the upcoming Alvarez Kovalev fight, right? Uskate isn't the kind of guy at this point that the Gale wants to spend a lot of time adding his scalp to his resume. Right? Time waits for no one. No matter how savvy many of us are here, each of our days is only 24 hours. So the Gale's abdicated the IBF title. And he's basically said to the world, I'm James DeGale. I'm looking for big fights. If the fight's big enough, count me in. Right? This is a guy who wants legacy. This is a guy who gets it. This is a guy who understands that the best gift boxing can give to you is a big time rival that you think you can beat. Right? So as painful as it's been, for James DeGale to lose as an amateur to George Groves and to lose as a professional to George Groves, right? George Groves right now is a huge opportunity for James DeGale because George Groves has gone on and has had a distinguished career. It's a big fight. It'll pack the arena easily, right? Easily. And it's the ultimate litmus test for James DeGale. If he beats Groves, then we can look back at the DeGale career and say, hey, you know, he got some redemption here. Who knows? Maybe if that, we'll call it the third fight, right? Because they've already fought twice. If that third fight, the second professional fight between the two, raises eyebrows, right? Is as exciting as their second fight. Then maybe they'll have a rubber match a third professional fight between the two men now contrast that with Anthony Joshua and let me just say this you know from a betting perspective the heavyweight division has been pretty good to me I know it's hard to believe the videos are all still up let me say this I've been wrong on heavyweight title fights because quite frankly I don't believe in either Anthony Joshua or Deontay Wilder as much as the public does. So I thought a rusty Vladimir Klitschko was going to beat Joshua. But that's okay, because the hedge held. Anthony Joshua won that fight by knockout. I thought a Luis Ortiz, who's older, we can debate how much older, I understand this is a hot topic in boxing, but I thought an older Luis Ortiz would beat Deontay Wilder. That's all right. The hedge held. Wilder won that fight by KO. Now, I did have a bad fight where I was unprotected. Trust me, I remember this. My bank account remembers this. I thought Joseph Parker would beat Anthony Joshua. I privately didn't even think it was going to be that close. That fight goes the distance. By the way, the only time in AJ's career where a fight's gone the distance. Of course, I was on the other side of that play. Fight goes the distance. AJ wins the fight. I was naked. My hedge did not hold. Right? I took losses on that fight. So let me say this. When I talk about AJ, I'm not talking about AJ as a guy who has lost a lot of money on AJ. Actually, I haven't, right? When a guy is knocking everyone out, folks, there's a certain way to play his fights, right? To give yourself a hedge or to win fights outright. But let me say this. I believe we're in a unique time in the heavyweight division, right? Big, bigger than usual. Flat-footed slugger types right now are ruling the roost, Right? Speed, agility, movement, timing, that's all secondary right now. I believe we're going to get back to speed, agility, and timing. In other words, this Primo Carnera 
era of heavyweight boxing, I believe, is going to come and go. Right? So let me say this. In this era right now, the guys who are king are unbeaten AJ, obviously, and unbeaten Deontay Wilder. Right? It took Tyson Fury to have mental stress problems to open the door to these guys. Right? Unique circumstances. Just think about who each of these guys beat to become heavyweight champion. Now, let me say this. The best thing that could possibly happen to AJ, and I mean the absolute best, is for there to be a rival. In other words, more than a contender. Right? A rival who has his own fan base who AJ can fight and beat. Right? When you think about the great fighters, folks, Ali you necessarily think about Fraser, Foreman, right? These names, Norton, these names pop up, right? You think Ray Leonard, then you think Roberto Duran, Thomas the Hitman Hearns, Marvin Hagler. In my opinion, you can't have a great career unless you have notable fights on your record that fans can just immediately associate you with at the end of your career. Right now, all I can say is this. Here you have Deontay Wilder. Right? Deontay Wilder. Unbeaten champion. Folks, I got to tell you, here in the United States, many people believe he's the champion at heavyweight. I've been reading articles from people like Tony Bellew who are saying, oh, Deontay Wilder, no one knows who he is. Tony must be just roaming around Liverpool asking people, look, over here, everyone knows who Deontay Wilder is. Right. By the way, let me just say this, too. We're talking about the World Heavyweight Championship. You can't become champ and then decide, you know what, as long as people know my name in the local pubs or in my home country, I'm good. Right? That doesn't work for a world title. Right? Champions have to have imagination, folks. They have to convince people further away than the limits of their own city. So let me say, Deontay Wilder is interesting because he's flawed, right? You have a guy who might actually end up being Deontay's mandatory, Dominique Brazil, who's already been stopped by AJ, openly talking about how he feels Wilder is lucky, openly talking about how Gerald Washington was spanking Deontay Wilder early in their fight. And understand it's interesting because Brazil trains with Gerald Washington. I know Gerald Washington's a gentleman, I'm guessing. Brazil and Gerald Washington sit down and talk about what an easy time of it Gerald Washington had early in that fight. Let me say this. You look at the early rounds of Wilder against Gerald Washington, and you look at the early rounds of Wilder against Luis Ortiz, and I see a guy losing a hell of a lot of rounds. Folks, I'm just telling you, in both fights, I had Wilder well behind on my scorecard before he started landing power shots, right? And in boxing, if you're a home run hitter, if you're a power puncher, you have a huge margin of error, don't you? Right? I know the judges saw it differently. I, who knows what fights they were watching? Let me encourage you to look at both of those fights yourself. So all I'm saying is you have a rival to AJ who's flawed, who's awkward, throws a great, throws a, an absolutely spectacular straight right hand.
but can't really set it up. Doesn't really have a lot going on on his left hand. Gets a guy in trouble, then starts windmilling. Right? Dare I say, looks amateurish at times. So if you're Anthony Joshua, you should be thanking your lucky stars. Right? Wow, the public thinks this guy's a rival to me? At a minimum, Joshua should be thinking to himself, well, look, I'll have a chance in this fight. Because this guy's not exactly Prime Lennox Lewis. Now let's talk about Prime Lennox Lewis for a moment. Lennox Lewis says, hey, look. Now keep in mind, Lewis is old school. Lewis is a guy who had to fight Mike Tyson. Made it a goal of his professionally to fight Mike Tyson. In other words, Lewis, Lewis gets it. Right? This is a guy who fought Evander Holyfield twice. Right? Lewis is on record as saying, look, Joshua should agree to a 60-40 split with Deontay Wilder. Right? Wilder is willing to fight Joshua in Joshua's backyard. Now, given this career-defining opportunity, understand, Joshua's already beaten one rival, Vladimir Klitschko. Right? If Joshua were to knock off Deontay Wilder in a mega fight, after knocking off unbeaten champion Joseph Parker. Right? Just understand the argument, even from people like me, who don't believe AJ is the best heavyweight. Right? The argument from AJ's critics would be muted. In other words, I'd be sitting there privately thinking... This AJ brother is lucky he never fought Tyson Fury, right? I'd be thinking, you know what? This AJ brother needs to stay away from Luis Ortiz. But if AJ in back-to-back -back fights beats reigning unbeaten heavyweight champions, I'd be in the bar, you know, hearing the AJ people, and I'd be like this, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, my voice would be muted. Even I would have to say, okay, if we're going to talk about the dominant heavyweight of this era, how could I ignore a guy who's mowing down multiple unbeaten heavyweight champions? Now, somebody here in the comment section to this video, explain to me how Tyson Fury is not AJ's next fight. I mean, understand, the best thing to happen to Joe Fraser was Muhammad Ali. Right? You think Carl Frotch hesitated when given an opportunity to fight Lucy and Butte? The best thing to happen to Chris Eubank was Nigel Benn. Now here you have an unbeaten heavyweight champion who would certainly be one of the biggest scalps on AJ's resume. And AJ's not fighting him. Worse yet, AJ's fighting a guy who has failed multiple drug tests, who's not unbeaten, who's already lost to a guy AJ's already beaten. Right? Povetkin lost to Klitschko, who AJ beat. Folks, this, this makes no sense to me. Oh, by the way, the stated reason is so AJ can protect one of his belts. What a joke. Could you imagine saying that to James DeGale who walks away from the IBF belt at 168? So he can have big legacy making fights. Could you imagine boxing press should go to James DeGale and say, hey, if you had multiple heavyweight title belts, and you had a rival out there, Deontay Wilder, who's willing to travel to your backyard to fight you. Would you give up one of the belts to fight Wilder in really a generational fight? Two unbeaten heavyweight champions fighting each other. 
right? Would you do that or would you say, I'm going to fight Povetkin? Now, let me just say this. You and I know the real reason AJ is fighting Povetkin, don't you? It's because there are many people, many people, among them Joseph Parker, who believes that Deontay Wilder, as flawed as he is, as flawed as he is, folks, I took Ortiz over Wilder, as flawed as Wilder is, there are many people who know AJ who believe Wilder has a real shot against him. Let me just raise my hand here. This is the part of the video where I say, yeah, I'm one of them. Right? Simply because AJ is not defensively blessed. I don't care how much Wilder weighs. People are saying 214 pounds. Folks, look at the weights of Joe Fraser and Ali for their first fight. I don't care how much Wilder weighs. If Wilder hits you with that straight right hand, he can knock anybody out. Right, folks? Rocky Marciano fought at less than 200 pounds. One of the hardest hitters. Tell Joe Lewis after he got knocked out the ring by Rocky Marciano how much Marciano weighed. Right? Jack Dempsey wasn't that big a guy. Hellacious puncher. Right? Punchers are born. They're not made. I'm just telling you that here you have AJ reduced to a jabber against Joseph Parker. There isn't a lot of room for error. I'm telling you, Luis Ortiz has a great chin. You wouldn't have known it from his fight with Deontay Wilder. So I believe the real secret here is the fact that the AJ people lack confidence in AJ's ability to go 12 rounds with Deontay Wilder. Let's just be real. Because it doesn't make sense that you would have a legacy-making fight like this and that you would pivot, literally pivot, to fight Alexander Povetkin. I got to tell you, I live on the West Coast in the U.S., I haven't heard one person, and I talk to sports people, I haven't heard one person crying for a Povetkin versus Joshua fight. Right, Several people want to see Wilder Joshua. Several. No one wants to see Joshua against Povetkin. Here's the kicker. Once again, I'll be betting against Anthony Joshua. Folks, right now you're getting six to one. I'm not convinced that a young guy who's still learning how to box, who decides he's going to use his jab a lot against Carlos Tackham and Joseph Parker, and let's face it, his jab isn't even, in my opinion, right? as good as Dylan White's jab, right? Don't believe me? How many rounds did Tackum go? Look at, excuse me, look at Tackum's face after that fight. Could you imagine how Tackum would look if he was bludgeoned by Larry Holmes for several rounds? Could you imagine how Tackum would look if he was bludgeoned by Buster Douglas for several rounds? Why is it that Carlos Tackham and Joseph Parker, <laughs> both guys, after several rounds against AJ, several rounds, why is it that both guys look in relatively good shape? Right? I think AJ is still figuring out how to be champion. I think his dodge... Let's just call it as it is. His dodge of Deontay Wilder, which includes cheesy videos from Eddie Hearn here online, offering Wilder other fights. What's that about? Could you imagine Carl Froch offering Lucy and Butte other fights? Could, could you imagine Chris Eubank offering Nigel Benn other fights? Could you imagine Fraser saying, no, nah, Ali, no, nah, no, nah, why, why don't you fight this guy? Come on. That's ridiculous. 
is this what's passing for boxing these days? You hear the old guard, guys like Lennox Lewis, saying, oh yeah, 60-40. It's a foregone conclusion in Lennox Lewis's mind that the proper opponent for AJ is Deontay Wilder. Foregone conclusion. But here we have dudes hiding behind their promoter and the promoter making cheesy videos saying, hey, don't fight my guy. Don't fight my guy next. I'll pay you $5 million to fight someone else. Folks, this is embarrassing. So I believe what's really going on here is AJ doesn't want to deal with Deontay Wilder. Too dangerous. He's hoping that Wilder gets exposed by Brazil, who he's already beaten. Right? He wants somebody else to take care of his Wilder problem. Here's the point I'm going to make at the end of this video. What AJ doesn't realize is he has a big Povetkin problem, right? I think the press is treating these guys like they're Ali and Fraser. Folks are really a bit too excited by AJ's win over a guy out the ring for more than a year. Vladimir Klitschko, who was what, in his late 30s at the time of the fight? who was literally on the verge of retirement at the time of the fight. And so, I don't think people understand how green these fighters are. As I said, Gerald Washington fights Deontay Wilder, is beating him until he gets hit with a bomb. I'll give Wilder credit on landing big shots against tough opponents, right? Wilder beats Washington, Wilder beats Ortiz. I'm not here to say different. But let's just say I don't believe Washington's convinced that Wilder's the better fighter than him. Washington's boy, Dominique Brazil, is not convinced that Wilder could beat him. Forget the unbeaten record, right? I'm just telling you that I believe guys like Tyson Fury look at AJ and feel that's a winnable fight. I believe Dylan White looks at him and thinks that's a winnable fight. I believe Joseph Parker understands that if he just fought AJ anywhere but the UK with a referee other than the ref who did the first fight, I think Joseph Parker in his heart believes he beats AJ. In other words, AJ isn't a Mike Tyson figure. Where Tyson's the champ and you get the feeling, <laughs> you get the feeling contenders weren't in a rush to get in the ring with him. Right? You got the feeling during the Riddick Bow raid that he didn't really want to fight Lennox Lewis. Right? In the 70s, I'm telling you, people didn't want to fight George Foreman. AJ's not the big bad wolf with other fighters. Let's just say the fact that AJ won't fight Deontay Wilder, what does a brother have to do? Wilder said, okay, this less than 50% money you're offering me, I'll take it. You want me to fight you in the UK? Okay, I'll take it. Just tell me when the fight is. Their response to him was, we know you've agreed to what we've offered here, but we're going to fight Alexander Povetkin because the sanctioning body, wink, wink, only gave us 24 hours here. Come on. James DeGale has figured life out, right? Jose Uzcatege, hey, nice guy. He's not George Groves. He's not Badu Jack. He's not Adonis Stevenson. Those are the guys DeGale wants to fight. We know DeGale. The titles at this point are secondary. Right now, here you have a guy with multiple titles who not only still going to have multiple titles if he doesn't run to fight Povetkin, but he'd have a shot at the title held by Deontay Wilder. And you mean to tell me that this guy offered a unification match? Is dodging Wilder? 
He's dodging him for a reason. Wilder's too dangerous. AJ lacks confidence. He wants somebody else to take care of his Wilder problem. He understands Wilder is a flawed fighter. And that fights between Wilder and people like Gerald Washington, Luis Ortiz, Dominique Brazil are high risk affairs. Right? So AJ is that unique champion who gets faced with a rival, a Fraser Ali type rival, a Carl Frotch, Lucien Boutet type rival, a Chris Eubank, Nigel Benn type rival. And he decides he doesn't want to rise to that challenge. It's too dangerous. Having the belt fighting at home is more important to him than fighting a rival, even one that's flawed, even one that got badly tested in his last fight. Simply shocking. As I said, I'm a little older than many of my viewers here. Lennox Lewis sums it up for me. He hears about the fight, he says 60-40. Right, 60-40, it's a wrap. It's happening. Right? I, <laughs> the, the idea that Wilder would say, hey, I'll take the money you're offering. I'll fight you in the UK. In fact, hell, I have a $50 million offer for you if you're up for it. And the guy doesn't take it. Just lets you know how ridiculous the heavyweight division is. I personally feel Povetkin beats him. I'll hedge the play with Joshua by KO. As I said, the hedges have held. My videos are up, folks. I don't delete them. The hedges have held in Klitschko Joshua, Ortiz Wilder, right? All I'm saying here is, if you're gonna give me six to one odds with a guy who doesn't even have the courage to fight in a higher profile legacy-making fight, I'm going to take them. I don't think AJ believes in himself enough to be this kind of favorite, right? Povetkin's going to force him to fight. It's going to be do or die, right? I also think, too, and people need to be aware of this, sooner or later, the boxing public turns on you, right? I remember Oscar De La Hoya got some charitable decisions in some big fights. The Pernell Whitaker fight comes to mind. Then the crowd seemed to turn on De La Hoya, who was still very popular. The scoring in the Felix Trinidad De La Hoya fight, uh, a little bit dodgy. The scoring in the rematch of the Shane Mosley fight, I don't think would have happened. That's a fight I quite frankly thought Oscar won. I don't think the scoring would have been the way it was if the boxing public didn't remember the scoring in De La Hoya's favor in some of his earlier fights right sooner or later the public is gonna say gee how come you're not fighting Wilder sooner or later the public's gonna watch a fight where he doesn't even stun the opponent right by the way I don't recall Joseph Parker ever being stunned in his fight. Carlos Tackham, when they stopped that fight, Tackham was losing the fight. Tackham's losing the fight. But after they stopped that fight, Tackham, who was completely lucid, said, hey, why did they stop it? Why did they stop it? Tackham, he's, he's dazed in that last round. It's a heavyweight fight, folks. It's a heavyweight fight. He's dazed in that last round against a champ who is being stretched in terms of rounds, who's never gone the distance in a fight, and they stopped the fight. Right? So all I'm saying is, you got a young champion here who doesn't want to push himself, doesn't want to risk his belt. Belts. Against Deontay Wilder. Right? He's hiding behind his promoter. Guys like that aren't 6-1 to favorites. I like Povetkin. I think Povetkin also moves a hell of a lot better than Anthony Joshua. I viewed Joshua as mechanical, big, and clunky, unable to bend at the waist. I like Povetkin. 
at 6-1, to one, hedged with Joshua by KO. By the way, Prevetkin, great chin, went the distance against Vladimir Klitschko. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. David Price did catch Prevetkin. Prevetkin wants shootouts. By the way, Price, of course, ends up out getting stitches. Right? I believe Prevetkin's going to raise room temperature. We'll see what happens. But I think the big story here is that AJ didn't want to fight Wilder. He'd rather make less money against an opponent who is less popular with the public. Think about it. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I'm sure there'll be a bunch of comments. I look forward to reading them. Thanks for stopping by.